fourth Sunday in Advent, O Lord, raise up, we pray thee, thy power and come among us, and with great might succor us. But whereas through our sins and wickedness we are sore let and hindered in the running the race that is set before us, thy bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us to the satisfaction of thy Son, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Well, verse 2 of Lent 151. Thou grantest pardon through thy love, thy grace alone availeth. Arks could ne'er our guilt remove, yet even the best life faileth. For none may boast themselves of any aught, but must confess thy grace hath wrought. Whate'er in them is worthy. Written by Martin Luther. I guess there's still some, some appreciation of Luther. I don't know. I've never heard Luther's name mentioned in any Episcopal sermons in the last 20 years. Very little. I don't know. What to do. Anyways, we're with Professor H.C. Porter, Dr. Porter, lecturer in history at Dad's alma mater, University of Toronto. This was published in 1958, Reformation and Reaction in Tudor Cambridge, a preface. In its original form, this book was awarded the Archbishop Cranmer Prize for 1952, and the publication has been made possible by a grant from the Cranmer Prize Fund. This prize is for an essay which shall relate to the intention and result of the changes in doctrine, organization, and ritual within the Church of England between 1700, 1500 and 1700. My work concerning aspects of fitting <clears throat> between two previous Cranmer Prize essays published by the University Press, e.g. Reign of Henry VIII and G.R. Craig's From Puritanism to the Age of Reason. Now, has he got a bibliography? Yeah, he's got a bibliography. Okay, great. Manuscript sources. We'll have to take a look at the bibliography later. A lot of standard names here. Overall, any of this is my understanding. From Puritanism to the Age of Reason, a study of the change in religious thought within the Church of England, 1600 to 1700. My greatest thanks are due to Professor Norman Sykes, who supervised and guided my work, whether essay, thesis, or book. I should like to thank those who've Discuss various sections with me, Professor Rupp of Manchester, Dr. Owen Chadwick, Master of Selwyn College, Dr. John Roach of Corpus Christi College, at Princeton by Professor Craven, and at Toronto by Professor Ears. Professor Bruce Dickens have been greatly appreciated. And, uh, some others who helped in the archives and typing manuscripts and exiles. Okay. And three, the universe of grace in terms of Cranmer's connection. Three, the Cambridge reformers. would be good to see that again, the Cambridge exiles. Part two, Puritans and authority, tribulations of authority, 1559 to 65, trouble at St. John's. Uh, Richard, Longworth and William Folk, the Puritan assertion, Puritanism and authority, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabethan, Cambridge. The Cambridge Puritans, part three, Grace Abounding, to 12, Theology of William Perkins, 1595, the, Cal the Calvinistic assertion, 14, Grace and Predestination, the doctrine established by authority. The question of Christian assurance, William Barrett, the Lambeth Articles, Peter Barrow, there's the proto-Arminian at Cambridge. Two Elizabethan Cambridge divines, Andrews, and overall, I think Andrews is an Arminian too. He gets a lot of good ink, but apparently. Claims to be, I think Bishop Fitz says he's orthodox on justification by faith, but you can't be like an Arminian. Introduction, Marcel Proust, Proust, 
Certain forms of existence are so abnormal that they are bound to produce characteristic faults. Let's see where that goes. Ideas, wrote Burke, entering into common life like rays of light, which pierce into a dense medium, are by the laws of nature refracted from their straight line. This is from his Reflections on the Revolution in France. The ideas discussed in this essay are those of the Protestant reformers, the Calvinist Puritans, and the moderating Calvinists. The common life, the dense medium, is that provided by the University of Cambridge. The ideas are the important thing of the relation between God and man, <coughs> nature and grace, but ideas can be historically appreciated only in so far as they achieve a local habitation and name. Here, that is, as they were developed by the teachers and students, the masters and pastors of a particular collegiate ministry at a particular time, whether in the dramatic conflict or a trivial round. The story of that is of Reformation in England, told from a certain angle. The universities are traditionally the nurseries of the church, and the contribution of Cambridge to the ecclesiastical history in the 16th and early 17th centuries has never passed unrecognized. But it could be argued that much of the history of the Church of England cannot be written by anyone not intimately acquainted with the life and habits of the older universities. The history, for example, of the Reformation, the Evangelical Revival, or the Oxford Movement. Certainly, the vicissitudes of the story can best be appreciated and most fully enjoyed by those who have experience of the senior and junior combination room and can savor their peculiar blend of the sublime and the ridiculous. <laughs> the charges against Degree Nichols, a Puritan master of Magdalen in the reign of Elizabeth, included the regrettable facts that he had sworn to root out all Welshmen in the college and that he was in the habit of leaving his cows to gaze in the court to the peril of the hall and the chapel and that he'd taken to wife a vociferous scold whose voice penetrated to the farthest quarters of the college to the disturbance of the students to that it were wish she had another dwelling house. At one moment, the historian of the 16th century breathes the intellectual air which St. Augustine breathed. The next moment, he's in the world of Sir Charles. Snows, the masters with its dons, victims of something like war hysteria. <laughs> It's sort of like gathering around the coffee pot after the lecture. Very blunt and straightforward and honest musings are occurring. <laughs> Sometimes you learn as much outside in the hallways talking to the prof or profs and the students who are digesting and turning ideas around. <clears throat> Usually the classroom's a little more where you do your learning. But I'm, I get what he, he's saying here. At the prayer book conference, some of the best moments I had were out in the hallways or going up the elevator with a professor or walking out of St. John's. Oh, there's some great moments there. And just beautiful. Mr. John Salt, Saltmarsh has compared Tudor Cambridge with its bees and butterflies and cornfields to Hardy's Castor Bridge. It was no less like Hardy's Hintock, where reasoning proceeds on narrow premises and results in inferences wildly imaginative, yet where from time to time dramas of grandeur and unity, truly Sophoclean, are enacted in real by virtue of the concentrated passions and closely knit interdependence of the lives there. From the religious disputes of Tudor Cambridge were greatly concerned 
with the passions and prejudices of academic persons. Erasmus was guilty of unpardonable, if picturesque, exaggeration when he described the Cambridge dons as he knew as Cyprian bulls with dung ears. Bucer was slightly more serious when he wrote of them as profligate Epicureans, but both men had been shocked by dis expecting to discover in Cambridge groups of rational beings associated on the basis of common affection and re respect and finding them instead, instead the slaves unrespited of low pursuits living among the same perpetual flow of trivial objects. Again, what can be learned of the Donish character from Winston Lee's four volumes in the later history of the university is directly relevant to the Tudor theme. Though it might be a little optimistic to take as a general rule his deduction from the tangled tale of Robinson's vote, that stupidity is far more common than deliberate wickedness. Anglicanism, it has been said, is a religion for dons. Was Puritanism any less so? <laughs> Anglicanism, the religion for dons. Dad always said, oh, those Anglicans, they got some real good scholars. And he'd get that tone. You know, he, he liked that. And, you know, there's some Anglicans in the family history. But we think they're from Northumbria. However that may be, the religious movements in Cambridge, from Erasmus to Witchcote, both influenced and were influenced by the structure and balance of power within the academic community. They were canalized in or vitiated by considerations of college feeling and scholarly animosity, as well as by constitutional questions of visitorial interference local jurisdiction and university rights and privileges. That is the nature of the refraction, and that is the interest of the story. Cardinal John Fisher, interesting he calls him that. He was made cardinal, I think, after he was imprisoned in order to perhaps influence Henry from taking his head and then you get the old anecdote of Henry's jibe that he was, they could send the hat, and he'd send the head with the hat on it back to Rome, or words to that effect. Fisher, emaciated in a very, in a very image of death, was beheaded on Tower Hill, in June 1535. This is from Philip Hughes. It's a different Philip Hughes, though, than the Philip Edgecombe Hughes that I had. St. John Fisher, The Earliest Life. The first of five Tudor chancellors of the University of Cambridge to meet death on the scaffold. The other four were Thomas Cromwell, Somerset, 1552, Northumberland, 1553, and Essex, 1601. Fisher was born in 1469. It was uh, 20 years older than Thomas Cranmer. For over 40 years, Fisher had been a man of high authority in Cambridge. Perhaps at no other time has the university owed so much for so long to one man. Indeed, of all the formative periods in the development of Cambridge, the bursts of acceleration, as it were, or the changes of gear, those years have claimed to be considered the most important they were without doubt the most dramatic and the least dull. They were also, and, and this especially fits them for the historian's pen, the most ironic. The Cambridge Fisher was the seed time of a strange harvest. The corn would have been alien to him. Fate, as Tudor poets were fond of pointing out, as a way of altering design. For instance, of the two colleges which Fisher founded with Lady Margaret as homes of orthodox religion and true learning were to be notorious strongholds of factious Calvinistic Puritanism. 
he that looked, he looked that it would should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. So, quote, biblical quote. Fisher had first made the long journey to Cambridge from his home in Yorkshire when he was 14. That was in 1483, the year of Edward IV's death. It's the college chosen for the boy was Michael House, founded in 1324 by Edward II's Chancellor of the Exchequer and situated where today stand the southwest corner of Trinity Great Court and the Bishop's Hostel. The choice was probably dictated by the fact that John there came under the tutoring eye of another Yorkshireman, William Melton, then in his mid-twenties. Melton was later to be master of the college, chancellor of York, and preacher of some renown. For near, nearly eight years, Fisher studied the arts course under Melton, the several, seven liberal arts, and the three philosophies. The course of studies in medieval Cambridge, Cambridge is described by J.B. Mullinger, the University of Cambridge, volume one, pages 342 to 348. To achieve the status of bachelor, he had to work at the trivium, Latin grammar, Priscian, rhetoric, Boethius, Cicero, Aristotle, logic, Aristotle again with Parva Logicalia, a portion of the Summa Logicales, written in the late 13th century by Petrus Hispanus, a native of Lisbon who taught in Paris and who became Pope John the 21st. In his second year, 1485, oh my, yes, wow, the time of Bosworth Field, he became a sophister able to take part in and not merely to attend certain disputations in the school. In his third and fourth years, he came to grips with natural, moral, and metaphysical philosophy as expounded again, yet again, in the works of Aristotle, with the commentaries of Dunn, Scotus, and Alexander Hales as guide. From questionist involving a nominal examination of the prelector, Fisher commenced bachelor in the year Lent, 1488, so he's 19, four and a half years after entering the university when he was 19. This involves standing in the schools with his fellow determinists on the afternoon of each weekday for, the month, for a month arguing his questions with those who cared to test him. A successful determination meant admission to the Bachelor of Arts. This is very helpful. There were now further three years of study under the inception as Master of Arts, a hard core of the quadrillum, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy, much more Aristotle, some disputing and a little lecturing. Then, after a grant of an approving testimonial by 12 masters of arts and a license to accept, he took part in the solemn public disputations of the commencement in July 1491. And being successful, he himself admitted master. So from 1491, Fisher assumed for a few years the mantle of the region or teaching master lecturing, disputing, attending congregations of the regions, the upper house of the Senate. In 1491, he was elected fellow of his college and ordained priest. After obtaining a dispensation from Pope Innocent VIII, where he was only 22, below the canonical age. Eventually, by lecturing on the Bible, and on the standard textbook of sound theological teaching, the Libri Sententiarum drawn up in the middle of the 12th century by Peter Lombard. This is a long-standing textbook, 1491, 
going back to the middle of the 12th century. I talk of the textbook with 300 years forming and shaping the thought patterns. After preaching to the university and passing through the detailed series of oppositions, responses, and replications, Fisher became qualified to receive in 1501 the degree of Doctor of Divinity. So he's 30 years old now. By that time, he had been for 10 years a busy administrator, proctor in the school, master of Michael Mouse, Michael House, as proctor concerned with raising funds for the rebuilding of great St. Mary's. He had met the lady Gr Margaret Buford, mother of the king at Greenwich in 1495. 1501, she appointed Dr. Dr. Fisher as her chaplain confessor. The following year, he was named in the deed of the foundation the first Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity in University of Cambridge. He was obviously, from all, all points of view, the appropriate choice. So Fisher's Cambridge career, extending now over 20 years, he goes in in 1481, and it's now 1501, and he was born 1469. <clears throat> Fourteen eighty three, seventeen years, fifteen oh one, twenty years or so, had been brilliantly successful. The stars were dancing for him, this tall, direct, and grave young doctor, slender and sad, but with ruddy countenance and a witty turn of phrase which nicely balanced the highly serious, the more highly serious of his virtues. I'll just insert here that the serum use was what he was hearing. In 1504, in swift succession, whoa, he was appointed Bishop of Rochester and Chancellor of the University. And I've seen his, we got a little name plaque in one of the choir stalls at Rochester. Born in 1469. By 1504, 30 or 35 years old, he's a bishop. Small, a smaller cathedral. Um, a smaller cathedral. The others. He was told to both offices. He was a hold to both offices until his death, thirty-one years later. So he dies in fifteen thirty-five. He dies at age sixty-six. For three of these years, from fifteen all fifty-five, he was also the president of Queens. Like Matthew Parker, Fisher may be regarded so far as his Cambridge career is concerned as a born Don who drifted naturally into administration. Certainly he had the qualities which were considered necessary for a successful university administrator and reformer. Caution, prudence, soundness. As a chancellor, he looked very straightly to the orders and rules of the university. The value of his work as patron and benefactor can scarcely be overestimated. Quote, calling every man to his duty, as well as in the schools for profit of their learning, as in the college, churches and colleges for due keeping and observing the service of God, endeavoring himself by all the means which he could to reduce the university to the ancient rules and statutes which began even then to grow out of fame. So he's there at 15, just as uh, Tom Cranmer's coming in 1503. 
in beginning his years under the chancellorship of Fisher. As bishop, his palace for continent seemed a very monastery and for learning a university. As chancellor, master, president, and professor, many times and for the encouragement of the younger sort, himself would be present at their disputations and readings and in disputing among them would bestow sometimes hours together the very mirror then and lantern of light. And though in 1506, when the king came to Cambridge, this would be the Henry VII, with Lady Margaret, Margaret and Prince Henry, and perhaps Erasmus too, the chancellor could oratorically declare that in his young days, they had stolen over well nigh all of us a weariness of learning and study so that not a few did take counsel in their own minds how they might affect their departure. Of the three reasons he gave for this, one was conspicuously no longer applicable. The strife with the town continued and the plague, but no one could say that in 1506 there were few or no helpers or patrons of letters. Weariness, if weariness had been there, had given way to a new spirit of self-assurance and achievement. The chancellorship of Frank Fisher marked the spring of the Renaissance Cambridge, no less surely than it witnessed the Indian summer of the medieval university. For the Cambridge of Fisher was in sharp degree a combination of the medieval and the new and much of the religious history of Tudor England is reflected and implied in the uses to which new men were putting the ancient institutions, the hostels, for example, or the religious houses. And I think that's where we'll have to stop. It's a very nice brief on early Tudor Cambridge with Fisher. And Henry the Seventh, Lady Buford, Lent one fifty one. And thus my hope is in the Lord, and not in mine own merit. Rest upon his faithful word and put down a contrite spirit, for he is merciful and just. Here is my comfort and my trust. His help I wait with patience. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.